Thank you very much, Director, for the kind introduction. Uh, I didn't expect to do this. Uh, Gauri here from ACM wanted me to talk to the staff of ACM, uh, and for that I said, uh, I don't have to prepare, I'll just come and, and say something. But then uh, she wanted to open it up uh, and make it the inaugural lecture in this, uh, this collaboration that we have uh, with ACM. So I took two weeks to write something up. Uh, uh, I usually don't write, I just read from notes, but uh, I thought uh, given the response uh, that we have had, I think it, it, it makes some justice if I wrote something and, and put my thoughts uh, into words. Um, and. Uh, talk about it uh, from a perspective of somebody who does the transmission of Buddhism from India to China. Um, when I started preparing for this, this lecture, um, uh, one of our colleagues at ICES, uh, Mark Hung, said that you have to do three things. Uh, you have to have an exciting paper, uh, you have to have a PowerPoint, and you have to make sure that people go away with something. Uh, so I've done a PowerPoint. Um, uh, I don't know if the paper is exciting, but at the end of this talk, there will be a quiz. Uh, so I uh, make sure that uh, people will go away with something. No, I'm just joking, but Mark Hung himself didn't show up. Um, but uh, let me say a few things about the Nalanda Sri Vijaya Center uh, that was established uh, recently at ICES, uh, thanks to uh, Giorgio, uh, the foreign minister, and, and uh, the Buddhist Lodge who have funded the center. Uh, we started off with a major conference on Buddhism. Uh, it was held in February. About 54 scholars participated uh, in the conference. Um, we are collecting papers, and hopefully by early next year, uh, the papers will be published, uh, perhaps in two or three volumes. Uh, we have also started uh, a, a monthly series of lectures. Um, I think we have handed out uh, the most recent lecture that will be done by Tony Reed. I don't know if he is here or not. On, on the 8th, uh, if you haven't signed up, uh, I will I'll encourage you to sign up. Um, we are, have also started this lecture series, ACM uh, Nalanda Sri Vijaya Center. Every month we'll have a lecture, uh, a person will come here and give a talk. Uh, next month we are thinking of getting Pierre Eve, uh, and he'll talk mostly on, on Hinduism or Brahmanism. Um, the Nalanda Sri Vijaya Center is supposed to focus on intra-Asian interactions, how uh, societies in Asia interacted with each other, especially in the pre-modern period before the 20th century, but also uh, during the 20th century. Um, we are getting some visiting scholars. Um, we'll have somebody who will be doing work on Buddhism for six months uh, as a fe fellow at our center. Uh, we'll have other activities related to both Buddhism and non-Buddhist issues of how um, trade and commerce and religion connected societies. Uh, um, our recent projects, uh, forthcoming projects, include a, a series of conference on Tagore uh, that will start off uh, from Harvard, uh, most probably in November, and we'll have something here in Singapore in March uh, of next year uh, to commemorate in 2011 Tagore's 150th birth anniversary. We're also talking to ACM and NUS about possible uh, research project on comparative diasporas, comparing Indian and Chinese diasporas in different cultural settings. Um, we are also thinking about doing something on trade and commerce in the ancient times. So we have a number of projects, and soon you'll get more information uh, about it. Uh, the support, I think, of uh, Director Kesavapani, uh, our director at ISIS, is the most important one. So let me come to the talk. Uh, I think um, we got a huge response, uh, most likely because of the title of the paper. Uh, I don't think anybody had heard about me, so I think why uh, Buddhism and not Hinduism attracted uh, most of the people. I don't know if I have the answer to that, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it. Um, uh, I've been asked uh, several times by friends and colleagues uh, about why Buddhist doctrines rather than Brahmanical, Brahmanical I'll use Brahmanical, instead of Hinduism here, uh, teaching successfully penetrated the Chinese society. Now, um, that, that is a question um, I, have, I have considered, but I don't think uh, I have I've really looked into it until uh, this, this last month. But before I, I go on, I just want to just show you two slides, and, and it, will, it will be related to what I, what I say later on. Uh, this is a, a coffin uh, from uh, the Liao dynasty of, of China, um, on, on it, you see various Buddhist chants are written here um, in, in, in Siddham script. Uh, the person is, is cremated and his ashes are stored in here. 
uh, he was a Han Chinese living in the Liao non-Chinese part of, of uh, the Liao dynasty. Um, the second one is, is uh, this slide. Uh, these are two figures, uh, Chinese Buddhas, Ruan and Liang. Uh, the unique thing about this is they are not in China, they are in Calcutta, India. Um, uh, two Chinese Buddhas in, in India, Calcutta. Uh, and this relates to uh, the reverse transmission of Buddhism that I'll talk about uh, as well. Um, now, uh, Brahmanism, why, why not Brahmanism? Um, this is a, uh, I, I thought this question uh, was, was irrelevant. Um, better answered by somebody who is more familiar with Brahmanism and is spread to Central and South, Southeast Asia. John Mexick is here, maybe he can talk more about that. Um, what has in intrigued me uh, during the past uh, decade of, of my studies on India-China interactions is the issue of the successful transmission of Buddhism to a society, uh, the Chinese society, that already had a sophisticated philosophical tradition, a distinct view of the spiritual world and the afterlife, and a strong belief in the preservation of family relationship and not renouncing them, uh, what Buddhism preaches. Thus, instead of spending most of the lecture on investigating why Brahmanism failed to penetrate the Chinese society, I'll focus on the issues pertaining to the transmission, acceptance, and the domestication slash transform transformation slash assimilation, the word that is more popular, sinicization of Buddhism in China. Uh, I'll argue that several key factors, such as the timing of the initial spread of Buddhism, the ease of selectively adopting and domesticating Buddhist doctrines and the creation of Buddhist pilgrimage centers in China resulted in the successful establishment of Buddhism in China. Also important may have been the multicultural nature of the transmission, the ingenuity of the Chinese clergy to impart foreign teachings within a Sinitic or a Chinese framework, and even the fact that the Buddha and, and the Buddhist teachings were misconceived uh, by a large number of Chinese lay followers. Many of these factors were either not available or not viable for the transmission of Brahmanism to China. It should be pointed out that Brahmanism was not only known to the Chinese, but there are instances when Brahmins from Southern Asia attempted to spread the religion to China. There were also several Brahmanical temples in China, but the worshippers were mostly members of the Indian diasporic communities. I must also uh, add and, and give some examples toward the end of the paper that even though Brahmanism failed to penetrate the Chinese society, it, mostly in its Buddhist form, had some influences on Chinese sciences and even popular religion. Let me start with the initial spread of Buddhism uh, to, to China. There are several issues related to the initial spread of Buddhism that need to be properly examined in order to comprehend the successful establishment of the Indic doctrine in China. First, it should be clarified that Buddhist missionaries from India, um, in, in quotes, India, may not have uh, played a significant role in the transmission of the doctrine before the third century. Second, it, it should be recognized, especially by those who want to highlight the Buddhist links between ancient India and ancient China, that the famous story about the Han Emperor Ming's dream about the Buddha, uh, the subsequent arrival of the first two Buddhist monks from India, and the building of the Chinese Buddhist monastery called the Pai Ma Si, or the White Horse Monastery, are just fabrications. The story of Emperor Ming's dream was meant to link the introduction of Buddhism with Chinese court in an attempt to give the doctrine legitimacy rather than record the historical transmission of the doctrine. There are other commonly accepted views regarding the path of the spread of Buddhism, the role played by Central Asian kingdoms in the initial transmission of, of the doctrine to China, the use of Taoist terminology by early translators. These have been re-examined by scholars and need to be reused to see how Buddhism was actually transmitted. Some of these uh, new analysis and inter interpretations have bearings not only on the successful establishment of Buddhism in China, but also on the Buddhist interactions between ancient India and ancient China. As recent as 2005, the story of Emperor Ming's dream was used as a historical fact in a book entitled India and China, 20 Centuries of Civilizational Interactions and Vibrations. The, the title itself sounds very propagandist. Um, I must add, the two authors are very close friends, and one is my teacher. Um, 
uh, they're right. Uh, the, the, the story begins uh, with Han Emperor Ming dreaming of in, in 64 AD. This is Tan, uh, Tan Zhong and, and, and Gan Zhang writing. A golden Buddha flying over his palace. This is a famous story. This led to China's extending an invitation for Buddhism to bless the country. This invitation mobilized Chinese officials and the monks to brave the hazards and perils of a long journey to the Buddhist shrines in India. Then this, uh, this flow of pilgrims stimulated the counterflow of Buddhist preachers toward China for helping to establish Buddhist institutions. Uh, this is an uh, Indian perspective, uh, mostly about how India influenced China. Uh, despite the fact that this story has been thoroughly discredited more than 100 years ago, uh, it is told and retold by Indians uh, and Chinese scholars and politicians from the two countries. Uh, the aim of many of these scholars and politicians who continue to emphasize the story is to draw attention to the ancient bonds between India and China and use it as an example of age-old friendship in the contemporary diplomatic discourse between the two countries. You must remember, 62, there was a war between India and China, and part of normalization of relations between the two countries is to look back in history and create uh, fabrications. Um, in order to comm commemorate uh, this episode, the Indian government recently sponsored the building of an Indian hall, uh, modeled after the famed Saji Stupa at the White House Monastery. Steps such as these by the Indian and other governments who have sponsored their temples at the White House Monastery uh, have given authenticity to a fictitious story that continues to be promoted by the Chinese. The undue attention given to the story and the attempt to link the spread of Buddhism to the Han rulers uh, and Indian monks conceals many significant processes and unresolved issues related to the beginnings of Buddhism in China. That is what uh, the scholars are mostly interested in, going beyond these uh, political propagandas. One question that has continued to perplex scholars is the question, when did Buddhism first enter China? The fairly reliable record to answer this question is associated with Emperor Ming himself and the Han court. It concerns a cousin of Emperor Ming called Liu Ying, um, who had the title of the King of Chu. Liu Ying is reported to have observed fasting and performed sacrifices to the Buddha at Pengcheng uh, in the present-day Shantung province. Sometime in the year 65 CE, uh, and an edict from Emperor Ming noted the Buddhist deeds and rituals performed by Liu Ying in the following way. And then I have highlighted here uh, Buddhist terms here used for the lay persons and the monks. I'll just read it and it shows on, on the screen here. The king of Chu recites the subtle words of Huang Lao uh, and respectfully performs the gentle sacrifices to the Buddha. After three months of purification and fasting, he has made solemn covenant or, or a vow with the spirits. Uh, what dislike or, or suspicion from our part could there be? This is uh, Emperor Ming, who is basically trying to uh, let uh, Liu Ying uh, off because uh, he was suspected of, of uh, rising up against uh, the emperor. Uh, let silk which he has sent for redemption be sent back uh, in order thereby to continue to the lavish entertainment of Upasakas and Shramanas. Um, so these last two words shows up in an edict at 65 CE that seems to be the earliest account found in the Ho Han Shu or the history of the later Han dynasty written by Fan Ye in the 5th century. If you look at the earliest account, the event dates to the 2nd century and found in the work called Tung Quan Han Ji. Uh, additionally, the appearance of the world shamanas uh, or, or monks in the Han dynasty is found in the work by Zhang Heng um, between 78 and 130 CE in Xi Jing Fu. Uh, leads to the, uh, the uh, availability of this edict, and especially the use of, of Buddhist terms at this early, early date. It is likely, therefore, that the Han court during the time of Emperor Ming was aware of the existence of Buddhism in China. Eric Zuscher, perhaps the foremost uh, scholar of, of early Buddhism in China, has suggested that Liu Ying's interest in Huang Lao uh, and Buddhism may have been concocted to, de uh, to the desire for the desire for bodily immortality. This interest in Buddhism as a source of immortality is also illustrated in some early uh, images of Buddha from China. Uh, this is from a tomb in Mahao in Sichuan. You see the, uh, the red arrow marks the uh, image of the Buddha uh, that uh, you can clearly see is the Buddha with, with, his, uh, 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 with his arm in front, uh, dated to second uh, century or the, or the first half of, of third century. There are other tombs also where you find images of the Buddha from the Han Dynasty itself. Um, and you can see the seated Buddha with two attendants here. 
uh, it seems that the notion of the Buddha as the giver, of, uh, uh, giver or god of immortality, both for the living and the dead, became popular in China even before philosophical and actual Buddhist teachings were introduced to the Chinese. One explanation for this misperception of Buddha as a god or giver of immortality may have been the fact that local Chinese initially came into contact only with Buddhist images rather than doctrines. Such images are on display at Mount Kungwang in, in Jiangsu province in the eastern coastal regions of, 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 of China. These images at Mount Kungwang date to the late 2nd century uh, and are engraved on the boulders of the mountain. They include figures of the Buddha in standing, seated, uh, and parinirvana postures. Um, on, on, the, on the left corner up there you see um, figures of donors, most likely, uh, who are dressed in, in dresses which are foreign or Kushana style. Um, there are also traditional Chinese motif of moon and Todd. Um, in addition to suggesting the presence of foreign traders in this region, these images indicate early amalgamation of Buddhist teachings with indigenous Chinese beliefs. Indo-Scythians and Parthian merchants, uh, with their commercial networks stretching from northwestern China, of uh, northwestern India to the Chinese cities and ports may have introduced the first Buddhist images into, into China. Diplomatic and commercial interactions between Southern Asia and the frontiers of the Western Han Empire witnessed significant growth after the collapse of the Xiongnu Empire in the first century BCE. This can be discerned from the frequent embassies uh, from, uh, from a, a kingdom called Chipin, which is identified, located in present-day Pakistan and, and Afghanistan. Uh, that mostly consisted of traders. Maritime trade between Southern Asia and coastal regions of China also developed rapidly during this same time. Hepu and, and Panyi, which is present in Guangzhou, seems to be two ports where merchants and merchandise from Southern Asia arrived regularly. Here, uh, what you have is uh, Han China, where some of the important cities, Pengcheng is located here, Luoyang, the capital of, of, of Eastern Han is located here. These are some of the trade routes uh, and the maritime routes that go all the way from what is present in Guangzhou to, to Shantung province, and all the hinterland cities are connected to trade routes. Um, the spread of Buddhism within Southern Asia in the second half of the first millennium BCE was also intimately linked to the movement of merchants along the trade routes linking urban centers. And, and here the map again uh, are the trade routes that, that link, and here you can see, if you, it's not that very clear, the monasteries are almost all, always located near uh, trade centers. Um, the same pattern uh, of Buddhism spreading through the trade routes across the urban centers may have also facilitated the spread of Buddhist images and ideas from Southern Asia to China. However, rather than relayed or, or contact transmission through Central Asia or Southeast Asia, Buddhism seems to have spread directly as a long distance transmission to China. This argument in case of the transmission through Central Asia has been made by Eric Zucher, who aptly points out the lack of archaeological evidence for the existence of monastic institutions in Central Asia before the third century CE. How could, he asks, a region without monastic institutions play a major role in the transmission of Buddhism to China? where Buddhism seems to have appeared significantly earlier than 3rd century BCE. This is perhaps uh, the, the idea of how Buddhism spreads from one city to another. Uh, the argument Eric Zucher is, is, is making is uh, that, that Buddhism bypasses this area, Buddhism bypasses this area and goes directly from Southern Asia to China, goes directly from Southern Asia to China because there are no evidence of monastic institutions here. There is no in, uh, evidence of monastic institutions here before the third century, but we know by first, first century there is Buddhism here. Um, the same question is, is valid for Southeast Asia as well, and, and John Mixi can perhaps correct me uh, on this. There's, uh, is there evidence of monastic Buddhism, Buddhism before 3rd century CE in, in Southeast Asia? Uh, in, in other words, what Zucher is arguing, uh, basically, is Central Asia and Southeast Asia may not have played the role of staging centers. Earlier, it was thought that Buddhism was, was transmitted to China through Southeast Asia or Central Asia and then to China as is commonly perceived. And in fact, Buddhism seems to have been present and established itself before monastic institutions started ap appearing in Central Asia and Southeast Asia. The initial work of Parthians and, and Indo-Scythian traders was continued by monks and missionaries belonging to some of the same ethnic groups, that is, the Parthians and, and Indo-Scythians. One of the first Buddhist monks in China was, was a Parthian named Anshakal 
who reached the Han capital, Luoyang, in, in 148. Two decades later, the, the Indo-Scythian named Trilo Tiachen, uh, Lokakshima, arrived at Luoyang. With him was the Indian, uh, perhaps Indian indicating the region east and south of present-day Afghanistan. The monk's name was Chu Shofo. Uh, there were also a Shoktian named Kangji. Uh, indeed, by the middle of the third century, the leading foreign monks at the Han capital were Parthians, Sogdians, Indo-Scythians, and a very few Indians. They were aided in their translation work by Chinese monks who came from different parts of the empire. The early translation process underscored the multi-ethnic venture of introducing Buddhism to the Chinese followers. Often more than four people were involved in translation of a single Buddhist sutra. The first person recited the text, either from memory or reading a manuscript. The second translated it orally into Chinese. The third wrote it down in, tr in Chinese translation, and the fourth edited the written version in Chinese translation. This method of translation of Buddhist texts, due to lack of bilingual specialists, continued through to the 10th century. A number of conclusions about the initial transmission uh, of, of Buddhism to China can be drawn from the discussion so far. First, it seems possible that Buddhist images started entering Han China sometime in the first century BCE with foreign diplomats and traders. By the time Liu Ying performed his, his ceremonies and, and Emperor Ming wrote his edict in 65 CE, some Buddhist followers may have already been present in and around the Han capital, Luoyang. Second, at the initial stage, the Chinese elite and the common people who came across Buddhist images had largely misperceived notion and limited knowledge about the Buddha and his teachings. The Buddha for them was primarily a deity capable of prolonging life, giving immortality. This perception most likely facilitated the rapid inclusion of the Buddha into the Chinese pantheon. Third, for the initial introduction of, of, from the initial introduction of Buddhist images in the first century BCE to the arrival of the first foreign translators, the transmission process involved people from multiple ethnic groups speaking different languages and who reached Han China either through the overland or maritime routes. All these factors contributed to the eventual success of Buddhism in China. The fact that the Chinese perceived the Buddha as part of their religious pantheon, for example, led to the early amalgamation of indigenous and Buddhist ideas at the folk level, albeit in distorted forms. This seems to indicate that already at the initial stage, Buddhism, in whatever diverse themes it was entering Han China, was being adapted to suit the spiritual needs of the Chinese. It is also clear that there were no organized transmission of the doctrine with pre-selected texts and groups of missionaries. Rather, for most part of its history, Buddhism entered China in very unorganized ways. The early Buddhist missionaries were mostly translators who did not force any doctrines or teachings upon the followers. In fact, the Chinese followers, as will be discussed a little later, freely molded the teachings, produced their own apocryphal texts, and even created their unique Buddhist pilgrimage sites in China. This Flexibility of practicing and modifying the Buddhist doctrine should also be considered a key reason for the success of Buddhism in China. A third reason could have been the multi-ethnic nature of the transmission of Buddhism. While India figures prominently in the later discourse of Buddhism in China, the initial transmission of the doctrine was carried out mostly by Persians, Parthians, and Sogdians. The transmission of Buddhism during the Han di dynasty was not simply an outcome of exchanges between India and China. Rather, it was a complex and multi-ethnic endeavor by people coming from different regions of Asia who were engaged in different professions. This multicultural and multifaceted aspect of the transmission of Buddhism may have facilitated the adoption and eventual signification of the doctrine in China, with the Chinese themselves playing a crucial role in this process. This is a topic I'll return to later in my talk. A fourth explanation for the, for the success of Buddhism at this initial stage is that of timing and circumstances. The growth of long distance commerce, active activity, and an expansion of the Han Empire into Central Asia contributed to the spread of Buddhist ideas into the coastal regions and the urban centers of Han China. It is commonly believed that the initial success of Buddhism in China was, one, due to political chaos at the end of the Han Dynasty, uh, that would be around the late second and early third centuries, and two, because of the ideological vacuum caused by the failure of Confucianism. However, if we were to believe that Buddhist terms and lay people and monks were present in Han capital in 65 CE, then 
Buddhist images seem to have started entering China sometime during the first century BC. It needs at least some time for the, the lay people and the monks to emerge. In other words, Buddhism may have perme permeated the Chinese society not during the chaotic phase of the Eastern Han Dynasty in the late second or third century, but at the peak of the Western Han conquest that would be the first century BCE. And if the argument about Prince Liu Ying's quest for immortality through the feeding of Buddhist monks and lay people is correct, then the interest in Buddhism among the Chinese elite in the first century CE may not have to do anything about the questions about the validity of Confucian teachings. The same holds true for those who decided to install the images of the Buddha in their tombs. These people, rather than being dischanted by Confucian teachings, seem to be interested in Buddhism for a better afterlife. In sum, I suggest that Buddhism was able to successfully infiltrate the Han society because of its amalgamation with popular Chinese beliefs, the ease with which it could be remodeled to suit the needs of the Chinese, the multi-ethnic cooperation that took place to render the words of the Buddha into China, and due to the expansion of the commercial networks that facilitated the influx of Buddhist artifacts and followers into China. The second phase basically uh, focuses on, on the transformation or the signification of Buddhism in China, how Buddhism really became a Chinese religion. Within two or three centuries of the initial spread of, of Buddhist images and ideas to China, the Indic religion has started significantly altering the lives of the Chinese. Vital to a successful integration of Buddhism within the Chinese society were the impressive translation project noted above. Similar to the initial transmission of, of Buddhism, the, the translation of Buddhist texts from both oral and written versions was not undertaken in any planned fashion. The early translators do not seem to have any systematized way or pattern of selecting and translating texts. Much depended on the text available to the translators. There were also a number of works in early phase that were put together in China with elements from different Buddhist texts and teaching. Additionally, a crucial role in the spread of Buddhism was played by apocryphal texts composed in China but claimed to be translations of Indic works. These texts placed core teachings of Buddhism within the framework of Chinese beliefs and traditions and played an important role in the dissemination of Buddhism among the common folks. The translation of Buddhist texts was an arduous process, which, as described above, involved several individuals. Some of the earliest, earliest translators included Parthian, Anshakao and Anshuan, Indo-Scythians, the Sogdians, uh, and the Indian monks, and of course the Chinese. Initially, the translations consisted of basic Buddhist teachings and the Jataka tales, which talked about the birth stories of the Buddha. Gradually, more philosophical works belonging to Theravada, Mahayana, and esoteric uh, traditions were also rendered uh, into Chinese. The importance of an early translation technique known as Goyi, which is usually used to explain the initial success of Buddhism, has been recently called into caution. Translated as matching the meaning, Goyi is, is described by Kenneth Chen in, in his often quoted uh, a book called, the Bud called Buddhism in China, a historical survey in the following way. Since the Buddhists of this period, his meaning the early third century, were familiar with the external or, or Taoist literature, it is not surprising to find them having recourse to Taoist texts for words and phrases to use in their translation. The, the, the question is valid here. Now that you are translating Indian uh, concepts and ideas into China, Chinese, what kind of terms uh, do we use? And, and here the argument is they are using Taoist terms. This practice of the Buddhists of searching through Chinese literature, mainly Taoist, for expression to explain their own ideas is known as Goyi, uh, or the method of matching the meaning. This method was used especially by the translators of Prajna Sutras for the purpose of making Buddhists uh, through more easily understood by the Chinese, Buddhist thought uh, more easily understood by the Chinese. Almost every work, scholarly as well as non-scholarly, that outlines the techniques of early translation of Buddhist texts repeats uh, Chen, Kenneth Chen's wo words. The use of allegedly uh, Taoist terminology by the early translators, on the other hand, is described as evidence of a Buddhist reliance on Taoism in order for it to gain foothold in China. In a forthcoming essay, Victor Mayer has challenged these two perceptions. Mayer demonstrates that Goyi was neither a common nor an important phenomena in the translation process. By examining all the occurrences of the term Goyi in, in Chinese Buddhist canon, where it occurs less than two dozen times, the Taoist canon, where it fails to appear a single time, 
and other Chinese encyclopedias and lexicons where it also fails to appear a single time. Mayer notes or concludes, one, that the, uh, the English translation of Goyi as matching the meaning itself is incorrect since the Chinese character Ge, uh, rather than meaning matching stands for lattice. Two, Goyi was meant to deal with numerical categories of, of Buddhist doctrines, uh, enumerations of items. Three, Goyi was not a translation technique but an exe exegetical method. And Goyi was an extremely short-lived phenomenon to begin with. Mayer also points out that many of the Chinese terms used by the early translators cannot be character characterized as Taoist. These terms either do not occur in Taoist works, such as the word Pen Wu, uh, fundamental nothingness used for, for thusness in, in Buddhism, or were not limited to Taoism, such as the word Wu Wei, uh, usually used to render uh, Nirvana into Chinese. Explaining the usage of, of the term Wu Wei, for example, Mayer writes, there's no indication that this was part of a systematic, conscientious policy of, of, uh, to appropriate Taoist terminology that was allegedly known as Goyi. Furthermore, Wu Wei is, is used to render more than half a dozen uh, different Sanskrit terms. And the negative Wu Wei is, is used as the beginning of more than 2,000 words translated from Sanskrit. It would be ludicrous uh, to insist that any Buddhist text which uses the word or, or term Wu or Wu Wei be branded as Taoist simply because they also occur in Taoist texts. Similar to the story of Emperor Ming, and, and this is again something I would like to take you back home that the, the story of Emperor Ming's dream is a fabrication and, and Goyi is doubtful, um, uh, two things. Uh, and the arrival of the first Indian monks, the acceptance of the an and, and unwarranted reputation of the Goyi phenomena simplifies the complex nature of early Buddhist history in China. From Mayer's argument, it is clear that the early translators had a more difficult task of rendering Indian texts into Chinese than simply borrowing from or allying with the Taoist. While it is true Buddhism and Taoist influence each other, the notion that there, there may have been some kind of a joint venture between the two religions during the early stages of Chinese Buddhism is most likely erroneous. It may be prudent to look at the similarities and contradictions between Buddhism and Chinese popular beliefs and cults to understand the successful penetration of Buddhism into Chinese society. It is also important to know the possible target audience for the translated text. Indeed, the use of vernacular language in some of the early translations, for example, indicates that the known elites and, and those lacking Chinese literary education were one of the important targets uh, of the translated text, target audiences. Uh, it is also crucial to look at the gaps that Buddhist teachings may have filled in the philosophical ideas prevalent among the elite members of the Chinese society. In this regard, Eric Zuscher has noted that the contribution of the, of the Buddhist theory of karma and river to adding a justification to the Chinese concept of penfen, or basic allotment, uh, to explain why people are, some people are born kings and some people are born beggars, and then karma nicely fits into this, this uh, notion. No matter what uh, technique uh, and, uh, the early translators uh, followed or, or who their target audiences were, at the time of translation, this text played a significant role in the deeper penetration of Buddhism into the Chinese society. Stemming from these translations were uh, commentaries the Chinese clergy wrote to explain the often complex Indic philosophical ideas, which were sometimes contradictory and often very different from the Chinese philosophies. Many of these commentaries were instrumental in the establishment of, of Chinese Buddhist schools. The translated text also stimulated the formation of apocryphal texts that, as mentioned before, tried to provide a Chinese framework and context to Indic teachings. And from a long-term historical perspective, these translations preserve Buddhist works that are no longer available in India. For the ordinary Chinese, however, um, many of the translated texts and commentaries would have been complicated and incomprehensible. The point of contact with Buddhism for these ordinary, non-elite, and illiterate Chinese were most likely the roadside storytellers, the paintings found in Buddhist caves such as those at Tunhuang, and the statues and images uh, of the Buddha and Buddhist figures. Uh, the models for many of these images and figures were usually imported uh, from southern uh, or central Asia. There are also instances when uh, artists from these two regions came to and worked uh, in China. Chinese pilgrims such as uh, let me see. Um, 
Chinese pilgrims such as Faxian and Xuanzang are known to have brought images and, and Buddhist relics with them from Southern Asia. Xuanzang, for example, brought back several golden, silver, and sandalwood images of the Buddha. All these prized possessions were, were displayed uh, at the Hungfu Monastery in the Tang capital, Chang'an, for public viewing. According to Xuanzang's biographer, Hui Li, uh, a huge crowd of common people and elite scholars turned out to view and venerate these sacred objects. The relics of the Buddha in particular had special meaning for the Chinese Buddhists. These relics included the so-called bodily remains of the Buddha, objects associated with his life, uh, and, and these were supposed to have miraculous powers, often with the ability to heal and cure those suffering from illnesses. Every time such relic was displayed to the crowd, people would come and, and, and do various kinds of religious activities, including a cutting of their, uh, their fingers, um, hoping that the finger will grow back um, because of the miraculous power of the relic. They never did. Um, they also served to bring the pious believers in contact with the founder of the religion, and this seems to be the most important purpose uh, because Buddha lived uh, a long time ago in a land very, very far away. To give the sense of proximity to the Buddha and the sacred land in which he dwelt, the Chinese clergy created sites within China to which a pious follower could visit instead of making the arduous journey to India. Mount Uthai, the perceived adobe of, of Bodhisattva Manjushri, was perhaps the most important of such sites in China. Starting from at least the fifth century, the Chinese clergy began adding references to China in the translations of Buddhist prophecies. Uh, this is manipulating the translations. Um, about the future ap appearance of Manjushri, not in India, but in China. Um, they also created new texts that made comparisons between Mount Uthai and mountain, uh, mountain in Himalaya, saying that that mountain is, is, is actually Mount Uthai in China. Apocryphal texts were created um, that publicized the legend by providing miracle stories about the appearance of Manjushri in China uh, and the pilgrimage of South Asian monks to the mountain to venerate the Indian divinity now living in China. So you have whole sort of things going on to create this, this pilgrimage site. Uh, in, in China. The legend of Manjushri's presence in Mount Uthai, in, in fact, spread very rapidly. And the mountain became a key pilgrimage destination, not only for the Chinese, but also for the Indians um, and other foreign monks in, in the 8th and 9th centuries. Uh, I have argued in my book uh, that the emergence of China as a pilgrimage center for foreigners, especially Indians, marks the transition in China's position as a peripheral outpost to one of the core regions of Buddhist world. Even in regard to doctrinal input, Chinese Buddhism was no longer dependent on the teachings coming from South Asia in the 8th century. Instead, it had charted its own course with indigenous doctrines, many of which influenced Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. The decay of urban centers in South Asia that supported Buddhism and the popularity of esoteric Buddhism in India were no doubt contributing factors for the emergence of China as one of the centers of, of Buddhist learning and pilgrimage. But the main point is a transition has taken place and, and China has emerged as a, one of the core regions of Buddhism. This does not mean, however, that Buddhist interactions between India and, and China declined rapidly after 8th century, as is commonly perceived. Rather, the exchange of monks, the translation of Buddhist texts into Chinese, and then the import of Buddhist artifacts from Southern Asia reached unprecedented levels under the Song Dynasty in the 10th, 11th centuries. What had decayed after the 8th century instead was the intellectual connection uh, between China and, and, and India in regard to Buddhism. While the Buddhists in China opted to pursue their own doctrinal discourse, the Buddhists in South Asia mostly took their own part of esoteric Buddhism. And here, uh, what I had started showing is, is this tomb from this uh, Han Chinese located in, in the Liao dynasty. These are all from the tomb of this person painted on the ceiling is this lotus. And, 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 and what you have here is a lotus, which is certainly a Buddhist symbolism. But then you have the Chinese uh, markings of, of the lunar lodges, and you have this, uh, the, the uh, zodiac signs here. So you can see the Chinese, uh, the Buddhist Chinese and, and the Western Greek uh, things have mingled together. This is a figure of hungry ghost, the, the depiction of Buddhist hell, uh, and, and a Buddhist monk playing chess uh, here. So you, you can see from, from what has happened in the ninth century, uh, Buddhism has really inflated into, into Chinese society and it has trans transformed the Chinese society in, in many ways. And of course, if we go even further 
um, uh, in, in, during the colonial period, we've, we have the Chinese migrating to India and taking with them Chinese Buddhism. This is again from Calcutta. There is uh, the two, uh, two Buddhas from China. This is uh, the Buddha also from China. This is the Chinese Kuan Yin. This is, uh, I think, uh, one of the very active uh, uh, Fokuang Shan organization in, in, in India, uh, which are actively propagating Chinese Buddhism, uh, not only among the Chinese in Calcutta, but also Indians. Um, like the legend of Manjushri uh, at, at Mount Uthai, which draws uh, or drew Indian pilgrimage, these examples of these are examples of reverse transmission of Buddhism from China to South Asia, a topic that needs to be addressed in a, in a separate paper. It is clear uh, that signification of Buddhism was a key factor for the successful penetration of Buddhism into Chinese society and its recognition as one of the three major religions of China. The Buddhist practices that we see in China uh, from the belief in Kuanin, and here you see the male and the female versions, or the female from China, the images of uh, Chinese Buddhas are consequences of signification of Buddhism. This signification of Buddhism included the mixing of Chinese and Indic beliefs, the composition of indigenous Buddhist texts and commentaries, the establishment of Chinese Buddhist schools, the creation of unique Buddhist divinities, and most importantly, the establishment of Chinese pilgrimage sites, Buddhist pilgrimage sites in China. At the same time as Buddhism was being synthesized, Buddhist teachings and other elements associated uh, with Buddhism were transforming the Chinese society. The Chinese concept of afterlife, the notion of hells and heavens, the view of universe changed dramatically after the introduction of Buddhism. Chinese art, literature, language, cuisine, uh, for example, with the introduction of sugar, uh, material culture, the economy, were all significantly influenced by Buddhism. Buddhist ideas on renunciation, action and retribution, meditation, monastic life, and uh, millennial uh, eschatology were all influencing uh, China as well. The important aspect of, of Buddhism that is often overlooked relates to the impact uh, of Buddhism on diplomatic and trading relations between China and foreign kingdoms. Many times we'll find Buddhist monks appearing on, at Chinese court as part of diplomatic missions. We also find the Chinese sending Buddhist monks, especially to India, to worship on behalf of the Chinese emperors. Within the context of the for China foreign relations, Buddhism played a crucial role more than just sending an exchange of diplomats. It challenged the perception of China as the only civilized country or society in the world. This was, the per this was primarily because Buddhist texts and the records of Chinese pilgrims portrayed the Indic world as sacred, civilized, and sophisticated. Some Chinese monks even argued that India and not China should be considered at the center of the world. Such depictions forced the ethnocentric Chinese scribes to give India a special position in the Chinese world order. So the perception of the foreign land also gets uh, transformed because of Buddhism. Finally, Buddhism also had considerable impact on the Chinese concept of kingship and, and statecraft. During the post-Han Han period, many of the rulers of the kingdoms that were established in northern and southern parts of China used Buddhism as state ideology and sometimes called themselves, similar to the title given to King Ashoka, a Chakravatin ruler or the universal king. Emperor Wu of the Liang Dynasty, Emperor Wen of the Sui Dynasty are examples of Chinese rulers who use Buddhism to legitimize their rule and to style themselves as Buddhist monarchs. Later in the 7th century, Empress Wu legit legitimized her usurpation of the Tang Dynasty and her own leadership as China's first female ruler. Kublai Khan, the Mongol ruler of China, and the Qing rulers also claimed to be Chakravatin. You can see one of them here, uh, Kangxi. Um, in fact, while Wu Zetian was portrayed as the future Buddha Maitreya, a female Maitreya, um, and the, uh, the Xing rulers were depicted as a reincarnation of Manjushri. Beyond the interest in the symbolic value of, of Buddhism, the rulers of the Chinese dynasties were also keen to use Buddhist monks because of their perceived magical and miraculous powers. Thus, foreign monks and members of the Chinese clergy who, are, who had visited foreign lands were called upon by emperors to avert natural disasters or secure victory in major battles. Xuanzang, for example, was called by uh, the Tang Emperor to help him win battles against the Koreans. He refused. Um, in regard to the question of whether Buddhism had conquered uh, a term used by Eric Zuscher or had it transformed China, 
Uh, Victor Mayer has noted that both questions require an affirmative answer. Buddhism both conquered and was trans transformed by China. What needs to be clarified, however, is that Buddhism here is not interchangeable with or equated to the modern day state of India or, or even South Asia. A Buddhist conquest does not mean Indianization of China, as was argued by the famous Chinese scholar Hu Shi. The transmission of Buddhism was a multicultural process that included people and cultural elements from regions beyond South Asia. Perhaps the term multiculturalization, a word that does not show up in a dictionary or Wikipedia, uh, is, is perhaps more appropriate. Uh, the term is sometimes used to describe the changes that take place within an immigrant community or immigrant communities, or the changes the immigrant, immigrating population brings to a host community. Uh, this is uh, in case of America, when, when immigrants reach, reach America, they multiculturalize uh, US. Buddhism, in, in my opinion, played a significant role in facilitating the flow of various cultural elements and peoples from South, Western, Central, and Southeast Asia that mixed with Chinese elements and created a synthesis of diverse cultures. Thus, I use the term multiculturalization not for the presence of multi multiple cultures in China, but to describe the contribution of Buddhism in mixing elements from multiple cultures and reshaping the Chinese society in profound ways. We come to the question here that all of you came to here. <laughs> so before answering the question posed as the title of this paper, I'll answer it in a few pages. Um, let me summarize some of the important reasons for the successful transmission of Buddhism to China and its establishment as one of the major religions of that country. The timing of the initial spread of, of Buddhist images and ideas, which coincided with the expansion of trade and commerce, should be considered as the first step. The misconceived notions of the Buddha and Buddhist images as a giver of immortality, leading to their incorporation into the Chinese pantheon, could be considered as the next important reason. This would be followed by the multicultural aspect of the transmission, the arduous but the vital translation projects, and finally the flexibility with which Buddhist teachings could be molded to fit and integrated into the Chinese society. In fact, the final point about the transformation of Buddhism into something Chinese, rather than it maintaining its Indic identity, may be most relevant to understand the long and successful history of Buddhism in China. Would it have been possible for Brahmanism to lose its Indic identity and become Chinese? The answer to this question might reveal why Brahmanism was not and perhaps could not have been successfully transmitted to China. It is clear from the Chinese sources that people belonging to Brahmanical tradition were present in China. These people were usually referred to as Polo men or Brahmins, although not all the people may have belonged to that caste. Some of these Polo men such as a person named Narayan Swamin, worked on concocting longevity drugs for the Chinese rulers. In fact, at some point, the Chinese rulers might have realized that Buddhism was not the religion that would either advocate or bestow longevity, as they had previously thought. Uh, as a result, a majority of these longevity doctors uh, in, in China seem to belong to the Brahminical tradition. There were also Indian astronomers employed by the Tang court who introduced Brahmanical tradition of calendar making. Others are known to have worked with the Buddhist in translation projects. There were also a few who came to China especially to propagate Buddhism, uh, Brahmanism. For instance, there's a mention of certain Brahmin from Sri Lanka, not India, from, from Sri Lanka, who wanted to transmit Brahmanical doctrines to China during the time the famous Buddhist monk Maharajiva was active in China. This is fifth century. The Brahmin is supposed to have asked, a very relevant question that we are asking today, if the winds of Sakya can spread to China, then how come we can't convert the Eastern Kingdom? We meaning the Brahmins. Uh, he is said to have come to China with Brahminical texts and challenged the Buddhists to debate him. Kumar Jiva trained one of his Chinese disciples, most likely in Hinduism or Brahminism, who debated and gloriously defeated the Sri Lankan Brahmin. The, th the story seems to suggest that the Chinese Buddhists defeated the Sri Lankan proselytizer in a debate and prevented the transmission of Brahminism to China. There you have your answer. The Brahmins were kicked out by the Buddhists. 
um, according to the story. But the things are perhaps more complicated. There are also notices uh, and archaeological evidence of, uh, of Brahmanical temples in southern China. In Guangzhou, there, there were three such temples uh, in, in the 8th century. Brahmanical images, probably from a local Brahmanical temples, have uh, been found in Quanzhou, uh, along with a bilingual Tamil Chinese inscription, which you, which you see down here. There are two slabs to it. Um, this, this is Tamil and this, this is Chinese. Uh, nobody has, I mean, this was on display here in Singapore a couple of years ago. Um, Moreover, in recent essay, which I was very fortunate to attend uh, in, in <laughs> out of all places in, in Israel, uh, a conference on, on Chinese imagination of, of India, a famous scholar, Meir Shahar, who has worked on, on the Shaolin Temple, has suggested the origin of one of the popular uh, Chinese uh, deities, Necha, uh, perhaps comes from Krishna. Um, and, and he has... A, 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 Quite a very, uh, quite quite an elaborate argument, which actually makes sense if you go through it, uh, starting with 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 the the, the, the serpent here and, and and some of the figures that you see in nature uh, earlier on. Um, even stories from Ramayan uh, and the figure of Hanuman uh, may have filtered into into China. There's a whole uh, article on on uh, comparing Hanuman and and Sun Wukong. Um, written again by Victor Mayer. Uh, I, I'm quoting him because he is my teacher. Um, I, I disagree with some, I agree with others. Um, despite all this, it is evident that Brahmanism as, as a religion uh, did not uh, have any impact on China as it did in Central and Southeast Asia. There could be many answers to this question I've posed for this paper. Most of these answers have to be speculated, not really knowing the extent to which followers of Brahmanism tried to proselytize in China, and also because the, most of the material that we have about the activities of Brahmins in China come from Buddhist sources. I'm, I will briefly outline three speculative reasons as to why I think Brahmanism did not and perhaps could not have, have penetrated the Chinese society. The first pertains to the issue of timing and the nature of pre-existing philosophical traditions in China. The second is perhaps the need for Sanskrit as the medium of transmission and for conducting Brahmanical rituals. The final explanation could be the inability of Brahmanism to transform itself to the same extent as Buddhism in order for it to be integrated into the Chinese society. Long distance trading network, as, as we have talked about, uh, itinerant traders were crucial to the spread of Buddhist images and beliefs to Han China. The presence of Kushan Empire, which supported Buddhism, facilitated the movement of Buddhist artifacts, traders, and missionaries through both overland and maritime routes. Brahmanism did not seem to have a similar extensive network of traders who frequented Chinese towns and coastal regions, or a strong imperial support until the establishment of the Gupta Empire in the 3rd century CE. By this time, um, Brahm, uh, Buddhism had already established its roots in China. Even if Brahmanical teachings had made it into Han China, the rituals, ceremonies, and particularly the caste system associated with the religion would have been difficult to establish in China. All these essential aspects of Brahmanism required a powerful priestly class, the Brahmins, which given the deep entrenched political order in China would have required an extensive overhaul of the Chinese system. Moreover, since the model of social relationship outlined by Confucius and accepted during the Han Dynasty included no place for the priestly class, the social system had to be revamped as well. In other words, without a complete Indianization of China, it would have been impossible to create an influential class of Chinese Brahmins. I don't know how they would look like. Um, Intimately linked to the above issue is the, uh, the use of Sanskrit for various rituals, ceremonies, and other Brahmanical activities. Unlike in Central Asia and, and Southeast Asia, where Brahmanism is, is uh, equated with Sanskritization because of the considerable impact of the language on, social, on local societies, it would have been difficult to insist on, a, on the widespread use of Sanskrit in China. Even among the Chinese Buddhists, the knowledge of Sanskrit was limited, severely limited. Indeed, the Buddhist chants and mantras had to be all transcribed into Chinese for the monks to recite in Chinese Sanskrit. Um, 
this could be, I'm sure, uh, there could be, I'm sure, many other explanations. And if you, some people compare it, why Buddhism, Brahmanism was successful in, in Southeast Asia, you can come up with other explanations. But with only these three examples, it is clear that unlike Buddhism, the transmission of Brahmanism to China would have required either a complete overhaul of the Chinese society or fundamental changes to Brahmanism, neither of which, in my opinion, would have been possible. Thank you.